to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi 2 as we're working our way through this uh, amazing book. And how the Lord is using this prophet to seek to wake up his people. They need to wake up. As a matter of fact, the sermon I'm going to preach this morning on divorce, if I if this would be preached 40 or 50 years ago, it wouldn't be a big deal for the pastor because most families were intact. Most people stayed married at that time. It's a lot different now because it has affected so many of us, even in this room. And so it's, it always becomes more difficult to preach that when you're living in that moment. But that's what Malachi was called to do because the things that the people were doing, what they were saying about God with their mouths and how they were professing God, was totally different as to how they were actually living and obeying God because they weren't doing that. So Malachi has to come in with the hard message, with the truth, in order to wake them up and turn them back to the Lord so that they would be faithful, so the blessings would flow out from the Lord rightly in that kind of way. So it it is uh, a little difficult. And as I was preparing the message this morning, I know that I'm not going to do justice to it. And you may have questions along the way. I mean, I could be preaching on this for three or four weeks, actually, to do it real justice. But if you do have questions, come and see me and talk to me. Because it is a tough message. It is a tough sermon. I'm just warning you up front, (laughs) spoiler alert, right away, because we're preaching on such a difficult and relevant topic. And it is a topic in Malachi's day. It was an indication of how far away the people have drifted away from their God and loving him and obeying him and seeking his favor. So uh, last week, you know, these are kind of the twin sins uh, that picture the disobedience and estrangement from God, the people in Malachi's day and throughout history. And we have the tendency to go that way far too often. Um, Their estrangement from the God they, they claim to love And so the people are coming to God. They can't understand why he's withholding their blessings, why he has no regard for their offerings. And it almost leaves you stunned, like a stunned amazement. Are you kidding me or what? Can't you see what you're doing? And you expect God to bless you? No, turn to him and live for him and the blessings will flow. So last week we looked at infidelity. We talked more about the spiritual aspect of infidelity towards God. This week we're going to talk about the physical aspect of divorce and just the damage that it does, the indication of where it has us in terms of our relationship with God. So, let's read um, Malachi chapter 2. I will begin in verse 10 and read through 16. This is God's word. Have we not all one father? Has not God created us? Why then are we faithless to to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tent of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And the second thing you do, You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let no one of you be faithless to his wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. And Lord, we come before you with complete humility and dependence upon you and your grace and your mercy. Just pray for wisdom and boldness, Lord, to bring forth your message. And it's a message meant in many ways to convict us, but also to comfort us and to bring us back, Lord, to you and to that relationship that is proper, right and just. And that the one that you desire for your people to have with you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would be with all of us, that you would be with me, that I bring forth your word. Uh, Lord God, in a 
in an honest and relevant way, Lord, so that you would be with me, even as each one of us together looks to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This is that second sin of divorce. And again, it just stuns me and amazes me. Doesn't, doesn't it amaze you that the people are living this way, that we could be living the way that we do and then wonder why God doesn't bless us? In verse 13, it says, The second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with your tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards your offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. And you say, you have the audacity to say, why does the Lord, why does he not do this? Why doesn't he bless us? Because the Lord is a witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you are faithless. So um, there's, there's like a colossal disconnect with the way people are living their lives and then what they expect to retur- in return from God. And it just seems unique to us, I guess, maybe. But if you think about it, it's just we're not much different than the people in Malachi's day. For t- far too many of these people in Malachi's time, they acted the way they wanted. They lived the way they wanted, right? As if God exists for them and there's selective obedience. You know, I'll obey God here where it's easy to or where I see fit. But over here, well, no, maybe not so much because I want my desires to be fulfilled in that way. So it's a selective obedient obedience, not a comprehensive obedience. For Christians, for those who love the Lord, it's a comprehensive obedience. It's doing it when it's di- obeying, when it's difficult to obey him, right? That's what makes faith faith in so many ways, doesn't it? When you're actually denying yourself and seeking to live for him. Basically, they were doing whatever they pleased to do, whatever pleased them, and still expected God to bless them. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that foolish? That's very, it's almost insane. It's arrogant to be sure and foolish. But like I said, there's nothing new or unique under the sun. Many churchgoers today or people who would call themselves Christians, who say that they love God, I certainly love God, but are not too concerned about obedience when it comes to certain things that they desire. Even though it's very inconsistent, at the very least, with the word of God, and even contrary to his word. As a pastor, I've heard so much over the years of the rationalizations, of the excuses. We'll just take two from our like dealing with our text in this context. So think about infidelity. I've heard people say, who are committing infidelity, right? Who are cheating, saying this. Well, it's okay because the person who I'm with now, not my spouse, but the person who I'm with now gets me. We have a true spiritual connection. You know, we even pray together and we even are in the word together. We're so close spiritually. Uh, do you see the disconnect? Do you see the insanity there? You're blatantly disobeying and sinning against God and then trying to say, well, but I have a spiritual connection. I pray with this person more than I pray with my own spouse. I'm closer in that way. It's twisted, isn't it? But that's exactly what I have heard and people do and say when it comes to divorce. God doesn't want me to be unhappy and miserable the rest of my life, does he? He loves me and he wants me to be happy. Or... Oh, when we got married, we were, we were young and we didn't know the things that we know now and so we weren't prepared. Or, you know, I'm just not happy in my marriage. Now, the cynic, the cynic in me wants to say, join the club. No, <laughs> I'm teasing. I want to be very careful of this. But if you show me one marriage that is happy all the time down the line, I, I do have oceanfront property for you in Arizona that you know, I could sell to you in that way. Right? It's work. It's hard work. And it's difficult. I fell out of love. God understands that. I need to be me. Uh, we, we've heard those excuses. And that's, that's taking this institution of God, what he's given, us, given to us very lightly, and therefore taking God himself very lightly in our lives. It's so important. And and incidentally, as I'm speaking to this, I just wanted to to press upon you the importance of premarital counseling. And I mean, serious, you know, sometimes, most of the times, it's just a formality. Those, the young couple comes, they're going to get married anyway, no matter what you say. But real premarital biblical counseling deals with issues and tries to head off problems or even a marriage that really may not be meant to be at the past. But try and tell somebody that who's intent on being married, right? That, but that's another subject for another day. But verse 16, I do want you to look at this because here it is. God is 
emphatic, powerful, plain, and no uncertain terms when he says um, this in verse 16. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. I want you to have that verse in mind. Now, the ESV, NIV translate this verse in this particular fashion. And what they're doing and what they're, the, right, the uh, translators behind that, they're using that strong language to get this idea across that God hates divorce. Other translations, uh, New American Standard, uh, NET, if you have that, actually get to the point. And they're more literal in this occasion. And they simply say that God, for I, God, hate divorce. That's what it says literally in the Hebrew. And I'm going to use my Hebrew. And Ruth, you could check me on this. And I'm sure you will. But it's he, sane, shalach. Amar Israel. And literally that means for hates divorce or to send away, says the Lord of Israel. That's the literal Hebrew in that regard. The God of love hates divorce. Okay? And we are to love as his people. We want to love what he loves, right? Don't you want to love what he loves? Yes, we do. Because we love him and he loves us. So we want to love those things that he loves and hate the things that he hates and avoid those things. This isn't, all, this isn't the only thing we're told in scripture that God hates. Proverbs 16, 16 through 19. This is just one passage. There are many we can look at. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. Do you like haughty eyes? That arrogance in people? No, we don't. We, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. Do any of you like any of those things? Is that what you do? do we want to, no, we don't want to engage in those things. We hate those things because God hates those things because it tears down his kingdom and his people. So with the people in Malachi's day, at this time, and we're, we mirror this so much in our own day. They were far, far away from God when you could be so cavalier about divorce. Not that divorce didn't happen in, you know, throughout the ages, but there are times in history, in Israel's history, even in the days of Jesus, what were the men doing? They were divorcing their wives with a certificate. I could divorce my wife if she burned the cooking and I didn't like it. I could give her a certificate of divorce. I never would do that because she's a really good cook. Uh, wait, that wouldn't be the reason. But it could be just about any reason if you're not pleased. with you. That's what it came down to. Do you see how insulting that is? you see how far away from God you are when you're so cavalier to divorce the one that you promised, that you vowed before God to love, honor, cherish, to care for, to have, and to hold, to keep until death do you part? This is a covenant before God. And that's, that's the language that's used here in Malachi. Now, we could see why, and I want you to see why, and I want to be powerful and bold on this. I want you to see why God hates divorce and why you should hate it as well as a Christian. Again, this isn't exhaustive. There's much more that could be said, but there, there's enough here in this text that you'll understand. You'll get the picture. And listen, he's primarily speaking to men the lord is primarily speaking to you husband why oh it's patriarchy no 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 because you are the covenant head of your family and you will give an account to god it doesn't mean that the woman's always innocent and doesn't you know not provocative in, in that in that way at times certainly but he's primarily addressing the men because they are the responsible covenant heads thank you very much you're welcome guys here we go Look, there are at least five things. I'm going to put five things that are here in the text. Uh, one by implication. The rest are mentioned specifically as to why God hates divorce, why we should hate divorce, and do everything that we can to avoid it. So we have strong families, loving families. That's what society is built on. We look around this day and age, all oh, the world's a mess, the world's this, the world's that. So much of that can be traced back to this, where the family 
has been and is being destroyed in so many ways. Again, that's another sermon for another time. But nevertheless, here's divorce. Number one, divorce defies. It defies the character and intention of God himself. We have an ever faithful covenant keeping God who loves us, who will never leave nor forsake us. We are the bride of Christ and he's not going to abandon us or treat us wrongly. So he defies this divorce defies the character intention of God himself. It opposes his plan, his design, his purpose, his intention regarding marriage and family. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Let's go right back to the beginning. Genesis 1. And you'll see this very plainly. Obviously, these are familiar passages. But this is the institution of marriage, of family, ordained by God. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And then we'll read Genesis 2, 20 through 24. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of heaven, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then in chapter two, beginning in verse 20, the Lord says this. Or the word says this, the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a suitable helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and he brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Amen and praise God. That's it. That's the foundation. That's the, the essence. Verses 14 and 15 in our own uh, passage this morning echo this, doesn't it? But you say, why not, Lord? Because the Lord is witness between you and the wife of your youth. Whom you've been faithless, though she's been your companion, your wife by covenant. You did not make, he, did he not make them one? Do you hear the echo? Do you see the, the connective tissue with Genesis 1 and 2? It's certainly there. Jesus said, no longer are they two but one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man separate. God hates divorce. It's emphatic. It's strong. And you need to get that into your, into your heart, into your mind. Again, we're a generation the word's been made so easy and so many of us have been affected by divorce that it's that it's almost been normalized. We we really blunted the edges on it, haven't we? In in so many ways. So number one, divorce defies the character and the intention of God himself regarding marriage. If we love him, we don't want to do that. We want to honor the Lord in our marriages. And make sure that we're faithful, not simply to our spouse, but to him as well. Number two, it's a sign of faithlessness. He says it right there in verse, in verse 15. Because the Lord is a witness between you and your wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. It's a sign of faithlessness. To be unfaithful, that word means. To offend or to even act deceitfully in that way. So, so it's not just speaking to having um, a physical extramarital affair. That may be involved in this, but... That word that's used there is really comprehensive of what it means to be faithful. That you, as a husband especially, wives also, obviously, but we are to be faithful to our calling as husbands to provide, to protect, to place our wives on a pedestal. And I'm being convicted right now as I say this. <laughs> First Peter chapter um, 3, 7 tells us this, likewise, husband, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. That's a beautiful verse. 
It's not a patriarchal, man-centered verse. It is a God-centered, loving verse where it doesn't mean that the woman is less valuable or you know, weaker in this way. No, 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 no. But, but she is to be treated by her husband with great patience, with great understanding as a precious vessel, as something very, very expensive, like a fine piece of china in that way that's delicate, that's beautiful, that we treat with care and honor and respect. And that's what's behind this. And that's faithfulness in that regard. Lovingly leading your spouse and your family with selfless sacrifice, sanctifying her. In other words, being the spiritual leader in your home as well, men. And and bringing, bringing your wife and your family along. That's faithfulness. But he says, you've been faithless in this way. You've been faithless to them. That's the opposite. And you see this where divorce comes in and where divorce plays a part in the picture. So often it's, well, you know, just kind of, what about me? What about my needs? What about the things I used to do? I could do so much more if I was alone. Oh, I remember when, when it was just me. So that faithlessness really points to a selfishness, a self-centeredness, a me-first attitude that, that my needs need to, need to take precedence even in the marriage. And what you do is you end up paying little attention to your spouse, to, to her needs, have little patience with her, show little grace and hardly any honor whatsoever. All the things that are opposite of what's being said. And that's not only an indication of... Um, you know, what's happening in the marriage, but your relationship to the Lord. That's what these people in Malachi were doing. They were faithless to their wives, especially in that way. So that's number two. Number three, it separates that which is meant to be and intended to be one in essence. It separates that which is meant to be and intended to be one in essence. Look, he says this. Again, I'm sorry, the uh, verse, bottom of verse 14. Because the Lord is a witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife. You're faithless. She's your companion and, and your wife. The companion. It's not good to be alone. We just read that in Genesis. Nothing else in all creation was suitable. Nothing else in all creation was, was compatible or comparable to the woman that God brought to the man. And so that idea of companionship obviously express, expresses commitment, that there's a commitment to you, that, 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 there's, uh, that, that there's compliment, you're complimenting one another with your gifts and your talents and the way the Lord has made us. We complement each other in, in our, our marriage. We complete each other in so many ways. That's what it's meant for. That's, that's the, the companion of your youth. Nothing else in creation is comparable to that. Do you know what divorce does? It undoes all of those things, right? It, it, it takes away. It doesn't stress commitment. It stresses, you know, my need for myself, a selfishness. That's what it absolutely stresses. It doesn't stress uh, complimenting one another, right? It doesn't stress. Ex- express completing one another. All those things are, are, are out the window with divorce. Now, do you see why God hates divorce? We become so numb to that. We become too accepting of it, I believe, um, e- even as God's people in this way. Now, so many men want a wife who, who basically pick up after them, clean up after them, pamper them, and protect them. And I said, yeah, protect them. You know how many wives have mama bear instinct towards their husbands who are not in the right so much, so much of the time? And I understand the instinct. You want to protect them. You want to protect them. And sometimes you do that to the detriment of not only your husband, but the marriage itself. But that's what so many men want. They want their wives to indulge them in their silly notions. You know, the boys will be boys. And again, I'm not against having a boys' night. I'm not against having any. But sometimes when it's just the boys' night, it's the game night, it's the poker night. You know, I, I have this. I have my time alone. I want to do this on my own by myself. Okay, there's a, there's a time and a place where you need to grow up. So I'm not saying you can't play games. I still play games occasionally. But there needs to be a time. So that's it. I, I'm, I'm leading in the way that I need to. Right? So many rationalize being divorced. Well, I could really be effective in this area and do what I want if I just wasn't married anymore. That's the mentality that we have going on today among so many. And we buy that. See, God hates divorce. He hates it. That's a very passionate, strong word. He can't stand it. You know what it means to hate something, don't you? He hates it. 
Number four, divorce shows a lack of integrity, uprightness, and honor. It damages your credibility. Why? Because it's a covenant. Again, he goes on to say, to whom you've been faithless, though she is your companion and a wife and your wife by covenant. By covenant. That's really important to understand. Covenant, you know this, is a solemn, binding promise. It's your word. It's your integrity. It's your solemn promise to do what you vow to do. To, to, to do what you say that you are going to do. There's a seriousness to it. When you take that vow, you make those vows in marriage, you are saying yes to God's purpose, to God's design, and to God's plan. With all that's in you, you put your integrity on the line. And I'm saying, you know what that's like in a lesser degree. When you sign your name to a contract, you know what you're signing, don't you? And if you have that integrity, you're going to follow through with that. It's a matter of honor. It's a matter of integrity. It's a matter of honesty. And how much more for the Christian who enters into covenant, the covenant of marriage. You understand? You see what divorce does? Divorce breaks that covenant, that solemn promise that's made before Almighty God and before man. And so you're relinquishing responsibility. It's a failure to honor the commitment that you made. And it's a failure of trusting in the Lord as you ought to. See? These are the implications. I'm telling you, we've just been numb to the idea. There was a time, even in this country, where what I'm saying today would be yes and amen. No, of course. Now it stings a little bit because we've gotten so far away from the Lord and from his word and the seriousness that's before us. Number five. Divorce, this is why God hates it. Divorce does irreparable, irreparable harm to the family. I don't care what you say, I care how we try to ease it over, how we try to smooth it over. You know that if you're a product of a divorce. If you live, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if when you're a kid or if you're an adult and your parents divorce. That impacts you, doesn't it? That hurts. It's not the way that it's supposed to be. And it's not the way that it's supposed to be. It affects the family. Not just the husband and wife, children, and the extended family as well. You know that. We all know that. Marriage provides, and this is the gift of God, it provides stability. That's what we all want. Don't you want stability? Don't you want order? Don't you want security? We love to have security. We love to know that we're loved and we're in that place where there's going to be that consistency and steadiness and they're there and mom is there waiting for the kids after school and make dad comes home. And you have, that's not just a pipe dream. That's the way that it should be. When we're doing that, we're just doing what we're called to do. But so, so few homes experience that, don't they? Marriage provides that stability, secure order, care, love, discipline, discipleship of children, where both parents make significant contributions to in raising their kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So how can a faithless, selfish, covenant-breaking man raise his children to fear God? Not saying it's impossible, but it's hard. How can you say, well, I'm, I'm, walked, I'm doing this. And again, in Malachi's day, they were at the point where it's just real easy to walk away, real easy to divorce, real easy to get that certificate and go away. And that's why the Lord is saying, see, this is what you're doing. How have we done this? Why aren't you blessing us? This is why. You're not being faithful with this most sacred institution that I've given to you for your good. Amen? And that's the thing. It's for our good. When it works the way that it should, it never works perfectly because we still live in a fallen world, obviously. But when we do what we ought to be doing, we see those results, don't we? There is more joy. There's more contentment. There's more unity and peace. God hates divorce because it devastates relationships that God has given us that are intended to endure. Right? It leaves deep scars no matter how much we come to accept it, no matter how much we've come to normalize it, no matter how much we've come to rationalize it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, it's the best thing. You know, kind of with a sigh, but it's the best thing. No, it might be the most expedient thing. It might be the most pragmatic thing. It might be the most practical thing, but it's never the best thing. It's never the best thing. I know you'll come up with situations where this person's, 
we could talk about those kinds of things, or abuse there, this, that, and the other thing. But generally speaking, it's never the best thing. If we love him, we will hate it, if you're a Christian. And if we hate it, then we'll do all that we can to avoid it, to prevent it, to keep it from taking place, won't we? By God's grace. The best thing is staying together, to work on being the spouse that you are called to be, to work through, to persevere, to pray, to pray to be changed by the Lord, to pray for your spouse, to pray with your spouse, to remind yourself of the covenant that you made, to remember your commitment to your spouse and to the Lord your God. Far too many, far too many professing Christians say the right things about marriage, right? You would all say that we love marriage. It's God-ordained institution, right? We believe in the institution, but when it comes down to it, far too many professing Christians go through with it, don't they? They're going to do it anyway. We just, just can't stay in this marriage anymore. If you don't believe me, you can check it out yourself, Pew Research Center, and you'd have to break down how they do their surveys and studies. The Pew Research Center shows, Pew Research Group, I should say, shows 51% of professing Protestant Christian marriages end in divorce. It mirrors the world's average, those who do not profess the Lord. It's got this, there's something wrong. There's a disconnect. This has to change, and it starts right here in the church. The world's going to do what the world's going to do, but we must resolve to be faithful to the Lord our God because it is for him that we do this. Amen? Now listen, real quick. The standard's the same for unbelievers. Just because you're not a believer. We, we try to let the unbelievers off the hook. Oh, well, they're, not, they're unbelievers. They're not really in Christ, so we kind of give them a pass. No, they don't get a pass. Right? The, the standard is the standard. God still hates divorce, even if you're not a Christian. He's not going to be, oh, well, you're not a Christian. That's okay. You know, you, you just don't understand completely. Listen, when there's an unbelieving couple, they don't believe in Jesus at all, but they have a wonderful, happy marriage, and so far as you can have a wonderful, happy marriage. You know what that shows? That shows that they are created in the image of God, that they bear his image, right? That, he, that they know in their heart of hearts that God exists, that the law of God is written on their hearts, and they ought to be thanking God and relying on God and depending on God who gave them marriage. That's the faithful, unbelieving couple. The faithless, unbelieving couple that does go through with divorce shows our need for redemption, shows our need for forgiveness in Jesus Christ, which is available, amen, and praise God. That's the hope, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But you understand that? Everything that we do, so unbelievers aren't exempt from it. You understand? But when they mirror, when they show, say, that's right, you're doing right because you are created in the image of God and you know God in your heart of hearts. So when you do something that is in accord with the law of God that's written on our hearts, that's what we say to the unbelievers. You're showing that you're created in the image of God and that there is a God and that you need that God. And when they sin, we show them, yes, you're, you're still an image bearer of God, but you're, you're showing yourself to be a sinner who's in need of forgiveness. And that's why Jesus Christ came. Everything, every area, every sin. So unbelievers aren't off the hook. You know, just, you know, well, he's not a believer, so it's okay. No, it's not okay. But for the Christian, this shouldn't even be an option. It shouldn't even be an option. It was never an option for us. A difficult time, every marriage has its difficulties, and some marriages have major, major difficulties. But it should never be. And I know that there are exceptions in Scripture, and I know in the case of infidelity or an unbelieving spouse, again, the more narrow scope here, it shouldn't even be in your mind as a Christian. Now, maybe you have to separate for a time or something, but that idea should not be in your mind to say, that's it, it's over, I'm getting a divorce. Because that does not honor God, because he hates divorce. Now, certainly, and I'm going to ease up a little bit here, <laughs> certainly, there are those who have done all they can to preserve their marriages, who the divorce would be the last thing they want to do, and they're not going to go through it, even if their spouse mistreats them the way they should. They are doing everything they can to save their marriage. But that other spouse just says, it doesn't matter, I'm going to go. Well, that person has done all that they could do to preserve their marriage, and there's not much that you can do about that. And there is sympathy there. Because if you are being faithful and your spouse still chooses to leave, that's another, that's another story. Again, another message for another day. But oftentimes that's the exception. And it's not without hope. I know this has been a very difficult message. It's been difficult to preach. It really has. Because I know you. 
And I know some of you, and I know what you're going through, maybe even right now. But the hope is, as always, is in Jesus Christ. And that's what Malachi was doing. He wanted these people to turn away once and for all and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because even when there is divorce, there is forgiveness for the truly penitent. Amen? Praise God. There's forgiveness there. We don't have to, it's not the unpardonable sin. You can get past it and through it by the grace of God. So amen and amen to that. It doesn't mean there won't be consequences, and there always are consequences. But nevertheless, there is forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you could rest in that. And you don't have to live in the guilt of the past in that regard as you're truly repentant in that way. That's what's called grace. Sometimes that's tough for us to give because we know how damaging it could be. We know how we've acted. We know what we've done. And it's hard to even fathom that God could forgive us. But that, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, whom I love very much, is called grace. Right? Amen. And we rest in that grace. Because which one of us, apart from the grace of God, could stand before him? Amen? Good. But there needs to be that true repentance and the resolve to actually live for him him in that way our hope is in christ in the forgiveness that we have in him divorce is not the unpardonable sin if you're in a tough place as a christian again taking from malachi we want to be different than the world the easy thing the most expedient thing maybe the most practical thing but you know what this just isn't working i'm gone i'm out if you're a christian you can't do that i mean you can but you can't you know you shouldn't you ought not to because of who you are in christ because it dishonors the Lord, because he hates divorce. So if you are in a tough place in your marriage, instead of divorce, seek reconciliation. Seek res- restoration. Be recommitted to Christ and to your marriage. Recapture what you had. Remember that first love. We're so often in Scripture, we're told to remember. When we're straying from the Lord, what are we reminded of? Remember the first love that you had. And that's, that stands true even in our, our marriages, and our lives. As, as we go through, we remember why we fell in love. We remember who that person was and can be, those kinds of things. Again, there's a lot of work, and I know there will be questions there. But nevertheless, we recapture that. Seek to. But ultimately, as Christians, and we're going to close here. As we realize the overwhelming importance of marriage, which... That's a sign of destruction to society when they don't realize that. And that's the time that we're in now. We don't realize the gravitas, the heaviness of marriage itself and what God has given to us. And so we treat it very lightly along the way for the most part, don't we? We know that in our society. But as we realize the overwhelming importance of marriage, that it's not just about surviving. Listen, man, the goal is not saying, hey, we didn't get divorced. At least we didn't get divorced. And we struggled through okay, that's small consolation. Uh, we survived. You know, we, we made it through. But you don't want to make it through miserably. You want to make it through vibrantly. You, know? you, want, you want it to, to grow. That's, that's the idea. You don't want to just survive. Oh, we stayed married. <laughs> you know? No, we want it to thrive too. Amen? Praise God. That's a big deal in, in the Christian life. We want it to be growing all the time in our love in different stages. Capiche? Does that make sense? It's not enough because, you know, being miserable and just surviving and saying, okay, at least we didn't get divorced. Ah, that's a little consolation, I think. It's some, certainly, but it's not. You want it to thrive. And the best way to get there, the best way to get there, and it's tough and it's nuanced, but there are a few things you need to know. The best way to get to where your marriage is thriving as Christians, because we go through the ups and downs, and we get tired, and we get lazy, and we get frustrated, and oh, and times, you know, all the seasons that you go through marriage. It's not a picnic. You know that if you're married. If you're thinking about getting married, it's a good thing. But also remember what Paul said, it's better to be like me <laughs> alone, and we could do work for the Lord. Keep that in mind. But if you're married, the best way to get there and to keep it there is number one, and I want you to understand this. It's going to sound a little, um, counterintuitive in some ways. But as a spouse, number one, you need to forget about yourself as much as possible. And I'm going to say that li- nice and loud. You need to forget about yourself as much as possible in your marriage. You're going to have to forget about having all the expectations of what's going to make you happy in a marriage, even if they're legitimate expectations. And there are legitimate expectations. But you need to even be careful with your expectations in regards to your marriage. I'm not saying you shouldn't have expectations because you ought to and they need to be biblical. Okay? But you need to be careful in how they're applied. You need to show grace, mercy, and patience 
that endures throughout the years. Amen? We're going to stay together in this. So we can't think so much about ourselves. And if my wife would just do this, then I would. If she would, be, and we all do that to an extent. And we might be right to a certain extent, but we need to be careful about doing that. Especially if it's Christians who love the Lord, especially in that way. Number two, the way to have that kind of marriage is not, not necessarily pleasing your spouse either. You understand? It's not necessarily pleasing your spouse. Now, we want to please our spouses. We want them to be happy, hopefully, in that way. When we're not in our moods. Um, but what I mean by this is there's a sense where you're not simply trying to be what your spouse wants you to be in confirming whatever their will or idea of a perfect marriage is. Do you understand? We're, we're, we're not there necessarily just to say, oh, yes, and kind of like I mentioned earlier, go along with silly demands or silly notions and here's what I'm going to do. And, and No, 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 we're in this together as Christians. And I do want to please my spouse, obviously, but we're not going to go beyond the bounds of Scripture simply to please our spouse, to placate our spouse, to keep our spouse happy so they don't leave us and so they're not mean to... No, understand? Those are number one, number two. Forget about pleasing yourself and don't necessarily try to please your spouse or simply try to please your spouse, um, especially when you're doing things that you know are not in line with Scripture. We're not here just to... Okay, yes. Okay, I'll play. I'm going to let you do it. We would never do that with our kids in, in that way. But here's what we need to do. And here's, here's the deal. Here's the, the trick. If there's one overarching idea um, that you would give to counseling in terms of marriage, you can do the 10 steps. You could find the five ways and you know this way and that way to be better. And, and there's some value in some of those things and the marriage seminars and all those things that we do. Um, but I think, keep this in mind, it's simple, but I think it's profound and it's, it is biblical, is to be intent at all times, at every time, in every season of your marriage, no matter what's going on with your spouse and in the marriage, that you be intent at all times to be pleasing unto the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the one who he wants you to be, who he's called you to be as a spouse. To do what he demands of you as a spouse. No matter what, what your husband is doing or your wife may be doing, you are called to be faithful to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and be that spouse that he calls you to be. You're not going to say, well, yes, Jesus, I'll be that spouse once my husband shapes up. Then I'll start being the wife that he needs me to be, that you want me to be for him. No, we, we, we don't do that. You're our goal is to please Jesus Christ more than pleasing our spouse. To please Jesus Christ more than pleasing our our kids, our children, because when we're pleasing Jesus Christ, then we will be ministering to and being who we need to be for our spouse and for our family. Do you understand that? Do you get that? It's so important to understand that. So, so we, we look to Christ. He expects me as a husband to lead my wife, to be a servant leader to my wife, to love her as Christ loves the church. Now, I have to look to him to begin to even be that kind of man, and I know how fall short I fall, but that is the intent and the goal and the desire, is to be pleasing unto the Lord as that husband who loves his wife the way Jesus loves his church. No matter how tough she could be on me, no matter how hard I'm messing with her, you know that, but that's right. That's what we do. And as, as, as my wife, that she is to support me and, and, and be in godly submission. Yes, godly submission. That's so hard. No, are you kidding me? I'm not going to submit to him. Are you right? Yeah, right. I'm not going to do that. Now, there's a difference between oppressive submission and godly submission. We could talk about that another time as well. Or you can ask me about that. But speaking that way, you do come alongside. We are called to be gracious, to be patient, to be caring, to be careful. So you do what he commands you to do before fixing your spouse or before your spouse does what you need he or her to do, right? You be who he's called you to be and leave the result to him. And when we do that, that strengthens marriage. When you're satisfied to satisfy him and when you're satisfied with him, and if it's your desire to know him more deeply, to please him from your heart, to obey him from your soul, 
because you belong to him, then you will see stronger, deeper, more vibrant, more lasting marriages as you honor Christ together. That would be the best. You're both honoring Jesus Christ in your marriage and in your life. That's where the difference is going to be because then I'm going to want to be because I'm being the man you want me to be because I'm following Christ and that's going to make you happy. Right? And you're being the woman that you're called to be and you're going to show that support. You're going to show that love. You're going to show that forgiveness and that tenderness in a genuine way. That's the woman that I want you to be because that's the woman he desires you to be. Do you understand? It sounds so simple. <laughs> the, the hard part is putting it into practice. But that's exactly what we're called to do, to trust in the Lord in that way, to take serious the vows and the commitments that we've made, to not give in, to not give up, to not mirror the culture, but stand firmly against the culture. Yeah, our marriage is tough. Yeah, and I might even have grounds for divorce, but I'm not going to because of my God. And I'm going to show you, world, the love of Christ and the reconciliation, the power of reconciliation, of recapturing, of recommitment in our lives. Let's stay strong in the Lord.